What Drives You is brought to you by Ziggler, your premier source for equipping life and leadership coaches. Visit Ziggler.com and let them inspire your true coaching performance. Yeah. The world is built on drive and there's no positive movement without driven people. Your authentic drive comes from knowing what you truly want and being in agreement with why that's alignment. I'm your host, Kevin Miller. This is the What Drives You podcast, where I talk with today's most positively influential people to uncover what truly drives them and extract the essence of what drives us in all the key areas of life. In this episode, we're kicking off a series on mind mindset and specifically a growth mindset. We're going to define that in, in a minute here, but I think most of you listening are aware of a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. And we all, like I have, probably think that we understand and think we have a growth mindset. And yet what you're about to hear is how we often sabotage our intent to be growth minded and we don't get the benefit. So we're going to have your eyes open today and be able to take some immediate shifts that will give you the benefits you desire from a growth mindset. My expert on the topic is Stanford trained mindset expert, Eduardo Brissinho. Uh, Eduardo is the author of the performance paradox. If you're watching the video, you can see it over my shoulder here. The performance paradox, turning the power of mindset into action. He's the co-founder of mindset works with renowned Stanford psychologist, Carol Dweck, who I've known of forever. Uh, you can find Eduardo at it's B R I C E N O dot com. Uh, you know, Eduardo, I am so honored as we were talking a minute ago that you read my book, uh, what drives you. And as you know, what drives us is our mindset. And my entire book is focused on helping people get clear on what they want and why, what I call alignment. That's the mindset of drive. And so for you to have read that and to have the context of that, I'm just, I'm, I'm really excited to dig into this topic. I love how you have presented it in your book. Um, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Kevin. And I, I as you said, I, I loved your book. I listened to it and I wish I had read it 20 or 30 years ago, but it's never, you know, better late than never. And I got a lot out of it. So thank you. Well, I, I would say the same thing about your book. I, you know, I think that, like I said there a, a second ago, that I've known a long time about a growth mindset and a fixed mindset, but I, I've known of a lot of things and I realized that, okay, but I'm not walking them out. And going through your book really, I mean, that's what we're doing here. It helped me clarify some of the things that I am not doing in a growth mindset. I mean, and I didn't feel bad about it, but I'm so grateful I know now, wish I had known sooner. And honestly, it reminded me here, here, let me see. I, I wanted to, to lead off with this. We recently had Dr. Benjamin Hardy on the show. I've had him on a lot. I, you know, he's the lead story in my book, his recent book with Dan Sullivan, 10 X is easier than two X. And he pointed out that a lot of us get the concept of 10 X. Uh, and yet we still go after it with this 2X mentality, this linear mentality. Your book, The Performance Paradox, had me feeling that as well. I get the concept of a growth mindset. It makes sense. I think I've got it. And yet I'm reading along realizing, okay, I'm still going forward with a fixed, I'm going after a growth mindset with a fixed mindset in essence. I mean, that's what you're, I mean, that's the point of your book. Is that is that a good synopsis of, yeah, that's what we're doing and get out of it. That's a great insight to take away from it. So, so thanks for sharing it. Yeah. Um, well, performance and the, you know, as I read it right off the bat, it really, what I got to looking at is performance versus even production. I mean, we, we want to, we go out there to perform, but what are we actually producing? It made me think of my kids. I had one time, a, one of my sons like dad, I, I vacuumed, you know, all the house in 10 minutes. Well, that's, Great. Did you actually clean the floors? That is the point here is to clean, not just to go. Is that what you see that we're doing sometimes? We're just performing, 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 but what, are we actually getting results out of it? Yeah. You know, we might, um, for example, like vacuum the house and just work on just vacuuming and, and never stop and think about how could I achieve whether it is vacuuming the floor or the higher level goal of having a pleasant home to live in, in a more effective way. So the performance paradox is kind of the, the counterintuitive reality that if we focus only on performing, our performance suffers. And that's something that, you know, I, I didn't realize until kind of well into my career. And, and, and what I mean by that is that, um, 
I, I had the assumption, like I think a lot of people have, that if we just work hard, we that's the way to succeed and that's the way to grow. Uh, but when I realized, I looked at uh, elite athletes, for example, like yourself, um, there's a lot of athletes have a, a clear distinction between what is a performance, what is a race, and what is training. And what what I, I what I thought, and I think what a lot of people think is that the way to become a great athlete, like for example, I, I think in cycling we can talk about cycling, and, and there's there might be more nuance, and you're the expert. But if you look at things like you know tennis, for example, you might think that the best tennis players become the best in the world because they've spent like 10,000 hours playing tennis. Right. And that's not the case. Like they, they become fantastic at what they do because they spend a lot of time doing something very different from playing tennis, right? If, if you're playing a, a, a championship final and you just want to win the game, you're going to be avoiding the moves that are giving you trouble. You're just going to be focused on minimizing mistakes, trying to win points. And then after the game, you're going to go to your coach and say, coach, I have, to, I have to work on this move that I was trying to avoid during the game. That's what I want to focus on now. And that's a very different activity than what we do during the game. And what, what often happens in work and life is that we're just trying our best, trying to minimize mistakes, working hard at executing, at performing, at getting things done. And that gets us stagnant. So that works to improve when we're novices. Um, but once we become proficient, we, we, we get stuck. We don't improve further because we're just trying to execute and perform. We don't realize that we have to do something different to continue to improve. That, you know, talking about cycling, I suffered from a lot. Again, I wish I had read your book because there was a lot of it that we, we go and we race and when we're, you know, weekend ends and then it's, we go train and we go ride and you do your sprints and you do your intervals and, and whatnot. And I, that's one of the things, I mean, I, I, I get credit for being a pro cyclist. I was incredibly, in all truth, I was very mediocre, very sporadic because I was not real coachable. I didn't step back and go, okay, well, let, how, do, how can I be a student of this? Now, you know, Lance Armstrong, uh, outside of the, you know, the performance enhancing drugs and all that, but he was a great student of the sport. Um, maybe even more about before him, uh, Greg Lamond. And he was always innovating. And that reminds me, or, or that, that brings me into that, that especially in work, some of the stories that you talked about, that we go along thinking we just do our jobs well, do our jobs well, do our jobs better maybe, but you know, just that incremental better as opposed to, you know, how do we, we got to innovate if we're really going to stand out. I mean, definitely in business today, wouldn't you say? Yeah, totally. And, and I, I heard you talk in cycling, uh, a reflection that you shared, which was that sometimes in training, you would approach them like, like performance. So you would just try to beat kind of the people you were training with and yeah. then you would kind of overtrain and then not perform as well in the performance because you were too tired. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so kind of getting clear that what is the goal is the goal to perform as best as we can or to improve so that we can incre increase our skills and our performance. And I imagine that in cycling, I don't know, but in, in training, you might do things like cross training. You might do weights or like you said, sprints or intervals, or you might spend more time in an anaerobic state instead of an aerobic state than you would in a, in a race. So, so the training looks different, right? Than what you do uh, during the performance. So and work to your point, you know, we, we go to work and we tend to kind of do the same thing every day in the same way, just trying to do it as best as we can, um, as opposed to doing things that will also lead to insights and to skills or to innovation. So that may be, you know, experimenting with new approaches or soliciting feedback or talking about mistakes or what surprised us to figure out, you know, what can we learn from this? What can we do differently going forward? And those are things that are different from just getting the work done. Okay. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to pull something out of the book though. I'm going to, I'm going to stay on your cycling thing. Cause it, you know, it's interesting when I really started learning in cycling, not just riding fast, training hard and, and, and whatever, uh, I'll never forget it. it was in a, in a big race, uh, call, called them criterions. It's like NASCAR on bikes. And I was following one of the best guys we had. He was actually our national criterion champion at the time following him. And where you think of, you know, the strongest guy wins. And I watched him and I noticed there's nobody conserving more energy than him. He is in here using the pack and going along. And I just, I just dawned on me as I'm, as I was following him. I don't know if I meant to follow him or if I just ended up and as the race goes on, I just ended up behind him. And I realized as I'm watching everybody go out the outside and do this, that he would just weave in and out. And I thought nobody, everybody's exerting more energy than him. 
it doesn't matter that he's the strongest. He is saving the most energy. And when it comes to the end, he knew how to get himself up front. And man, he was fresh as a Davy, Daisy relatively. And it was, it, it really, yeah, it came way outside of the box of, you know, train hard, learn how to corner, learn how to, it had nothing to do with that. And so I take, I, that's my preface of, of personal experience. You talk about, and, and we're not going to talk about just work. Um, it's just so, it's just so acute to look at it though. And instead of just getting better at our jobs, doing it faster, more efficiently, whatever, making more calls, sales calls, like you talk about in the book, you said, no, our economy in our fast changing economy today, we need to do things like identify unmet needs. I mean, that, that word alone, who is doing that in the average business right now, sitting around, they're doing what they're supposed to do. They're performing. Like you say, who's sitting around going, wait, are there any unmet needs that we're not filling for the workplace, for the employees, for, for, for the clients, for the customers, whatever it is. So identify unmet needs, drive innovation. That was your number two. I forgot about that when I said it a minute ago and give personalized service. Man, that's just, those are outside of the box of performing. Those are things that as you're showcasing, those get left undone. And yet that's where the primary opportunity is, is what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. And and part of that is like we just you were just talking about observation of observing this other you know, cyclist, uh, this world class cy cyclist, what they're exactly. doing and um, and what you can learn from them. So in that case, in that case, you're observing a great, very skilled person and learning from them, which ties to what you said about growth mindset and fixed mindset, because if we are if we are in a fixed mindset, which is the belief that abilities are fixed, when we see somebody who is fantastic at what they do like that, it makes us feel bad about ourselves. It makes us feel like, oh, I'm not as good a cyclist as that mm -hmm. person. I'm not a natural like they are. And so we tend to kind of want to protect our ego, maybe make excuses or just think about something else, as opposed to when we're in a growth mindset, believing that we could get better, we can always continue to improve. Then we observe people like that. And we, we like you did, and, and think about, hey, how could I emulate some of the things that I'm, that I'm seeing? Um, but to your point about innovation or, or met needs, we can apply that observation, that deep observation or empathy to people, you know, to people who we want to serve and try to figure out, you know, what would delight them? What, what might be needs that are not being met right now? Okay. Well, you've still got me stuck on the cycling thing. It's so relevant. Again, I, I need to go back in time and read your book and race again. Uh, because the mistakes you bring that up and that's a big part of your book. It's like chapter three or I can't remember what it is, five, whatever it's, it's mistakes. And I'm going to go ahead and jump there because that's another thing that I found myself in my career, my cycling career doing. And it was, it was really an ego based thing, Eduardo. Uh, it, it really was. And it was, I, I'm not going to risk, honestly, I'm not going to risk the win because if I totally go for it, if I totally attack, if I totally take off. And, and it doesn't work. I'm probably going to be shot. I'm going to go out the back. I'm going to get nothing better to stay up here and get a top 20, make a little money, be a little respectable as opposed to that. And then I look back and it dawned on me at some point, but it was really late in my career. I mean, the guys, the glory goes to the guys who go all, all or nothing. And sometimes they get nothing. Well, it doesn't matter if you get nothing nine times, because if you totally win the big event on the 10th try, it's so great. And meanwhile, I'm just getting these mediocre performances, but it was, it was, a. Uh, again, I, I like to think of myself. I mean, I do in some areas have no problem trying things and failing, but in that one where it was really, things were really on the line, literally I didn't, I protected, I really protected my ego, I guess. Didn't I? I mean, that's what you're saying. We often do. Yeah. Sometimes when we, um, when we want to protect our ego and prove rather than improve, prove yeah. that we're worthy then we don't want to put ourselves out there and fail, but we would rather not try. Uh, and then that will not make us look bad or feel bad. Yeah. That line, I have that written down, proving versus improve, improving is huge. Do I want to prove to everybody? I, I, I want, I almost want everybody to sit with that one for a minute. Like we should take a moment of silence, maybe pause your show. Do you, are you in what you're doing? Are you trying to prove Man, it's been a lot of my life, Eduardo, honestly, or do I want to humble myself? I mean, that's got to be a real, a, a real aspect. Well, to be confident, am I confident enough to not have to prove myself to improve? Am I confident enough over here? I mean, that's really what it takes is got it. You got to step back and be willing to, you know, maybe even to look the fool. Is that fair? Yeah, I, I agree. You know, for me, I also spent a lot of my time and sometimes I fall back into it, into wanting to prove, right? And so into um, pretending that I know more than I don't know or sh hiding 
what I am not sure about or what I'm not confident about or hiding um, uh, my mistakes. Uh, so trying to portray an image that is different from what's going on inside of me rather than being transparent, which helps me better learn and collaborate with the people around me and build deeper relationships. And I, I have I interviewed like over 100 people from my book, and I found a pattern that a lot of high achievers felt, first felt like they had to prove their worth to themselves and to others before they could be free to actually like be humble and and be honest with themselves and with others and focus on improving rather than than proving all the time. Uh, and I I I do think we all have a, a need to be to feel worthy. And I think sometimes we kind of we need to prove that we're worthy before we can be free to really act in a more genuine way. Uh, but sometimes we 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 stay in that cycle of proving 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 and we never get out of it. Okay. And I want everybody hearing these, we keep coming up to these, as you're talking about these things, I think everybody like me is resonating with, okay, yeah, I've done that or I'm doing that. And that's where, where I want to point out again, that's where as much as we want to have that growth mindset, that's fixed mindset thinking that we're realizing that we all fall into. What's interesting to me as I was reading your book and your own, and your story, literally Eduardo, is that you, you talked about school, that in school we get taught to make the grade. I mean, I learned that early on, man. It's just all I got to do is cram, memorize, and make the grade. Didn't learn a thing. Don't remember anything. You know, my kids are, I think, my kids are, are primarily appalled at how little I know with their basic schooling. You know, uh, I wasn't super academic, but yeah, it, it doesn't, we, we make, we, make, we program for this. And even in your work initially, you know, you, so you come out, you get a, a good paying job and you realize you said a minute ago, you were hiding, hiding what you didn't know, kind of doing the imposter syndrome thing. You really felt like that. And yet you were still rewarded even in work. It doesn't make sense. So you're not focused on improving. You're not getting, as you talk about so much in the book, you weren't getting feedback. You weren't being honest afterwards going, okay, guys, I didn't know what on earth they're talking about. Help me learn. You didn't do that. And yet you were still benefiting financially. You just felt bad, felt like an imposter. And that felt bad to you and caused a shift. But it's, it, it almost, as I read it, how, how does that happen? How do we still get uh, rewarded even in work, even financially, when we're really not producing what we could? Absolutely. And, and it, like you're saying, there's so many systems that reinforce this chronic focus on performing rather than on improving. And it starts in school. So to, to, to build a little bit on that, I just think it's really ironic that a lot of kids, like I know I was super curious before I got to school. And there's a lot of research that shows that young kids ask so many questions until they get to school age. And then they sit there and they listen to a teacher talk about things that they're not interested in talking about things that they feel they're never going to use. And so I think school is largely extinguishing this kind of curiosity and this drive to learn and to improve things that are useful or things that are interesting. Um, and that's a, and, and, and then everything gets graded, right? All the student work gets graded with a letter or number, which sends the message that what we want is to prove, is to show that we know everything we're doing. We are, we, we are getting a hundred on everything, which means that we school is even teachers are seeing school as a performance zone, right? As the, as the final, as opposed to the practice. And so we learn to just do what other people expect, you know, do the, 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 the performance. And that, you know, that goes into the, into, into the workplace too. And the, the, the ironic thing is that we are rewarded for it, but when we embed the learning zone into, into the performance zone, into our habits, then we can actually perform higher. We can actually achieve more, whether it's in sales or anything else. Um, but it, it, it involves a time delay because the learning, learning is an investment that pays off, you know, in, in the future. Um, and, and it's not, we're not clear on the difference between the learning zone and the performance zone. And so we, we, everybody is op operating on the assumption that we just have to go to work and do the work as best as we know how trying to minimize mistakes. And people are rewarded for that because we're not clear on the distinction. We're not clear on what's the way to get even greater results. Yeah, it brings into that, uh, you know, going from school into work, that idea of you get a job somewhere and, oh my gosh, Jane is the first one there every morning. She's always the first one. She's the last one to leave. She's always there to do whatever. She makes more calls than anybody. She does what, and, and what you're asking then too is, yeah, but what are the results? Because what if, what if Sue is over here spending half the time? And, you know, she's, she's off playing half time and gets twice the results. I mean, the, the results is the point. 
even though if we've got a business, that's what we want. We don't want somebody who's just there working. Like you talk about so often in the book, it's not just working harder. It is working smarter. I think you use the, uh, uh, story of Tom Brady in the book of somebody who says, yeah, I don't want to just go out there and work harder. So if one workout's good, five workouts is better. He says, no, 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 I want to get the most out of it. And of course he's the you know best of all time, but it does, it flips that it, it flips. It's more uncomfortable. It's more comfortable. I guess that's a lot of it. I mean, the fixed mindset, the things that we do, the norm, it's just more comfortable. It feels less risky. And I guess it is just like me. It was less risky if you want to be a mediocre cyclist. And that's what I really turned out to be as opposed to really knocking it out of the park. Yeah, it can be. I agree. Um, it can be more boring, but less risky. Uh, it can be more comfortable. Uh, but then, you know, what we can gain from fostering the, the belief that we can evolve and shape ourselves and continue to become and go into unknown territory and try new things and try new relationships, uh, try new skills. We can gain so much more fulfillment, so much of a richer life, deeper relationships, greater skills. Uh, we can pursue things that we are interested in that are uncomfortable, but that then are going to give us a lot of fruit because we'll achieve them. But also the process right, to get there makes life a lot more interesting and fulfilling. Well, something that you're, that this topic brought up to me, and I've said it on the show before, but writing my book. So writing my book, I mean, this is just you know, a couple of years ago and I'm writing it, uh, Eduardo. And, you know, I'm, I've got, you know, here's my structure and I got to, you know, they're telling me come up with stories and, and stuff. So I'm thinking, and I'm coming out with all this stuff and I'm kind of feeling good about myself. Like, Man, I'm just a wealth of information. I got, a, I'm amazed at the knowledge that I have. It's just in there. And yet, as it went on, I, I, I also started realizing, and it's amazing how little of it I've implemented, how, how this is something that I know it's stuck here. I'm pulling it out on paper <clears throat> and I haven't done the work. And that was pretty convicting. I had to really kind of uh, give myself a little grace uh, on that. But you know, the, that this aspect of performance versus, versus learning. I mean, again, this is personal development. That's the industry that we're in right here. Personal development. Uh, and if you're listening to podcasts on Apple podcasts, this is in the self-improvement category. It is so tempting, I guess, or so prevalent that we are surrounding ourselves with this. We're hearing this stuff. It's inspiring. It's hopeful. It's positive. And I think that there's a, you know, osmosis effect of stuff getting in there. And yet we can do that. I'm so amazed that we can do that for so long and really not take action on it. And that's what you're talking about. When do we stop and actually change? When do we make a change? When do we make a shift in a habit in anything that will help us towards that growth? And, and I even got to thinking as I was reading your book, I, I want to do a better job like this. We're doing this series that in my wrap up on part four, I want to state what is the specific thing that I want to change? I want to take this series, take this talk with you, take the studying of your book and this topic and, and the conversations. What do I want to see change? And if I'm going to, what's going to change the next day to help me get towards that? If I don't do that a month down the road, I'm going to have forgotten most of it. It would be inspiring, but uh, I won't have changed anything. Yes. Yeah, I, I love that. And and something I love about your work and the way you approach this podcast and everything else is that you you portray yourself as a work in progress. You know, we are we're all works in progress, but when we make that visible and explicit, we create cultures of learning. We normalize learning and continuous improvement. Um, and it makes it easier for the people who listen to you, right, to emulate you and to say, okay, I want to do that too. And the other thing that brings up for me is that it's it, it tends to not be effective to try to get better at everything, right? It tends to be effective to think about what do I want to work on now? And what habit do I want to build or shift and kind of take it one step at a time? And um, and that, you know, the fact that we we always have more work to do and 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 we always can get better, which is a growth mindset that makes life more interesting. You know, it, perfection is not attainable. Uh, it's a direction we can drive toward in terms of getting better. Um, but, but that makes life more interesting and, and it just, it, you know, it doesn't have to be where we, you know, if you, if you worked on your book and you, you haven't implemented everything, like I wouldn't expect that that would be a fixed mindset, right? If you, if you couldn't improve further at drive, that is the definition of a fixed mindset. The, the, the gr a growth mindset is the understanding that we can always get better. 
Goodness. You know what? It, it's thank you for pointing that out. I did a class last week, uh, an online for this national high school program for kids who are pur- pursuing entrepreneurship and whatnot. And of course they're asking about drive, you know, like finding what drives them, what they're, what they, what finding what they want. And they ask a question like that, like, what's the, you know, what's the number one thing that you would give us or something like that. And, uh, in regards to that, I said, you, you guys can only see so far. You, you, I mean, to, to come up with what your full on purpose is and what drives you uh, and, and it just stays static from that point on is impossible at your age. And since then, though, I've been thinking about that and thinking even for myself that, yeah, it evolves. I, I'm, I'm going to have to revisit this constantly, maybe not every day, but every week, every month, every quarter and, and go, gosh, am I, I mean, today I'm 52 years old. What drives me? I have different goals now. They've changed in different season. It's going to change. So that again brought me back to the otherwise, yeah, it's a fixed mindset to think I'm going to have one thing. I'm going to have one career, one goal, one focus, as opposed to no, there's going to be seasons and cycles and I may do something for a while and my taste is going to go away from that and come to something else that this growth mindset, if I adopt it correctly, is what sets me up to to transition kind of like, uh, uh, gosh, that was the focus of Arthur Brooks book, uh, strength to strength. We had him on the show and it's saying, yeah, you're, you're, we're at the point of transition, the second half of life. And if you're open to that and expecting that with a growth mindset, you can do it. Otherwise fixed mindset, you're going to go towards, and you talk about, I mean, you're going to go to, I mean, burnout's the number one word that I hear fixed mindset. So that maybe that would be, would you say that's a red flag? Um, that even be a good, I'm going to, I'm going to give you that question. Some red flags, some red flags that you may think you're in a growth mindset, but if you're in a fix, here are some red flags. I would say one of those is burnout. Would you agree? Um, burnout, it would be maybe like a, a, a flag that there's an issue you need to work on, right? I mean, the, there's, there's something that's not working for me in my life. And if you feel helpless and you feel like there's nothing you can do, then that would be a fixed mindset because yeah. you're 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 just helpless. You don't know what to do. If you feel like I can learn how to overcome this, I can learn how to make this an opportunity turn this into an opportunity. I need to figure it out. Then that would be you know a growth mindset. But but in a growth mindset, we do experience less anxiety and depression, so we're less likely to to be feeling burnout uh, because you know, there's life, there's a lot of change going on in life. There's struggles, there's, there's failure. And when those things happen and we're in a growth mindset, we, we don't, it don't, it doesn't hit our ego as much. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that we're incapable. Uh, it means that we can learn from the situation and try different things and overcome the situation. So that makes us more resilient and less likely to, to feel things like burnout. That's interesting. Anxiety and depression are, red flags of a fixed mindset because yeah, when you're talking right there, the first, the the thought that came to mind is if I have a growth mindset, it offers hope. Is that fair? Yeah. There's always hope because there's always something that you can learn. Uh, You can also have, you feel more agency because you can chart your own path. If you know, if you haven't gone down a path, you can, you can go down that path and know that you don't have to have all the answers. You can figure out the answers along the way. Uh, so yeah, yeah, if you're feeling fear to leap into the unknown, that could be a sign of a fixed mindset where you feel like people either know things or they don't know things rather than learn and develop things. Uh, if we react defensively to feedback, that could be a, a, um, a flag of a fixed mindset because it, when we receive feed criticism, for example, um, it, it might feel like a personal attack if, if people, it, we interpret it as you are you're incapable, you're not worthy, as opposed to here's some information that you can learn from. Uh, so those are some of the, or if we see effort, for example, if when we when we tend to work hard or we need to put effort into things, if that makes us feel badly about ourselves, because we have this idea that effort is something that only incapable people need to work hard, you know, naturally talented people don't need to work hard, then that kind of, that, that in, um, discomfort with effort could be another flag. And so when in any of these flags, we can think about, is there an assumption of an ability or quality that I see as fixed that is that is underneath this, that I might be an assumption that is flawed? Is that could be could that be something that I'm telling myself where, you know, it's not true and it's not serving me well? Goodness. Okay, I want to read a couple statements that I just that are just so strong. This is right out of the book. Uh, that just uh, kind of reiterates this. A growth mindset is not a silver bullet. 
It needs to be in tandem with effective strategies and habits for growth. Just because someone is in a growth mindset doesn't mean they know how to learn or implement effective strategies to actually improve their skills. Uh, those are, I mean, that's big again. So I've got a growth mindset. I hear, here's something I want to go towards or something I'm, you know, not feeling I'm making progress for, but to have a growth mindset is not just, I think I've, I've viewed it a lot of just, it's having an open mind. That's just having an open mind. And that's just so shallow compared to what it is. Again, we're back to the, but what is the strategy and the habit that will walk out that growth? And that's just what we're missing most. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So to be a motivated and effective learner, you need a growth mindset, the belief that we can change because sometimes we like the idea of getting better, but we don't like the idea of change very much. We can't improve without changing. So we need to believe that we can change. We need to know how to change. Uh, what are the effective strategies to change, which is grounded on leaping into the learning zone as opposed to the performance zone. But there's lots of different strategies. It could be deliberate practice. It could be seeking feedback. It could be uh, 360 reviews or whatever. Um, so, so first is I can, I can learn or I can change. That's a growth mindset. Second is how to change or learn. Um, third is I have a why I have a reason why I want to put in the effort to improve and to perform. And then finally, so those are the three essential components that make us a motivated and effective learner. And then the fourth, that's really, really helpful is when we feel that we belong in a learning community, meaning the people around us are learners too. They're people who want to improve. They are soliciting feedback. They're sharing with each other what they're trying and what's working and what's not working. And we feel like we belong in that community. So when those four conditions are true, whether it's individuals or teams, or organizations, then we are, we're fantastic learners that can kind of chart our own path and our own becoming. Okay. So you brought up, yeah, the learning zone and that you got me thinking to, again, a structure of of my, you know, of my day, my week, whatever, but how much, almost like a budget, how much time am I spending performing, which I, I'm going to put that, you know, we're doing the show right now. So is this a performance? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. But so is the rest of the stuff that I do, how I reach out to guests or how do I vet guests and, uh, you know, me getting other, it's still, it's just still, it's me doing the work. That's the performing. When am I going into the learning mode. Well, you know what? Tell me, talk to me about this because as a part of a growth mindset too, some of the things I want to learn. And yet when it comes to my business, trying to think if this is something that goes across the board, not just for those who own a business, but in my business, at least there's some things that I realize we as a company need to do. I don't know if I'm going to go learn that thing. I'm going to have a growth mindset for the company and I'm going to hire somebody or I'm going to hire a team to do X, Y, Z like that, like social media right now. I'm not going to go learn that stuff, but if we're going to do well, we need to have those channels open. So I'm going to pay to have somebody who's, you know, my growth mindedness is paying or delegating to have that done. Is that fair? Absolutely. You know, like you can ask the question, how can we become better as a company? And then the answer to that uh, might be something that you learn or something that, that somebody else learns and how you collaborate. And what I would point there to is we want to be clear about what our higher level goals are, right? What is the, if we ask why, I mean, why am I interested in having a business? Uh, why, you know, why, 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 why? We want to be most growth minded and learning oriented about our highest level goals. And so if, if you think about what's important to you in your life, I bet that to improve at that, the answer is not learn social media, right? Uh, yeah. And so, so if you want to get better at how you live, you know, the answer at some point becomes, I want to work with somebody who wants to become great at social media so that together we can accomplish these things that are important to me. Okay. So you, I'm, I'm going to read that, what you said again. The, so what you just listed off a minute ago was uh, it's actually chapter seven, the growth propeller is what you use five key elements that drive growth. And you said, one is your identity. Two is your purpose. I'm going to come back to these purpose, three beliefs, four habits, and five is community. Uh, so let's go to that identity one. Uh, and the story you lead off with what I wrote, I'm, you know, as I'm marking up the book was my identity as a learner. Do I identify as somebody and what it made me think of, do I, I, is I, you know, do I identify as somebody who's learning and growing as opposed to somebody who's figured it all out back to the, you know, the ego or something, uh, or somebody who, uh, is, is incapable. Yeah. Is, I've, I've gotten as far as I can go. I feel limited in that. 
or do I have that? And that's, I mean, that's big right there for everybody to stop and think about how do you really identify diff- We're going past the intellect of what you think you should do or, or, or what you think you might be doing, but how do you really if looking in the mirror face to face? Do you look at yourself and say, yeah, I am somebody who learns and grows and changes. Have I got it? Totally. Yeah, I agree. Uh, absolutely. Okay. And I would say like, also who continues to become and whose identity might evolve. Like, you know, uh, I, you know, I talk about people in, in, in the book who might really strongly identify as a teacher and then they, they evolve to being a, a stay at home mom and then an executive assistant and then a business owner and then, you know, an executive of a large company and then a mentor to other CEOs. Yeah. And throughout all that time, you know, Linda Rabbit saw herself as a learner, as someone who would continue to evolve. That's really, really what's most important. But at the same time, in the other aspects of her life, as somebody who went through different seasons, like you talked about earlier, and who wasn't stuck in in one rigid identity that was going to kind of keep her at the same place throughout her life. Okay. You said a rigid identity. And a minute ago, you said, uh, what we're, uh, what we're becoming that, that resonates with me that, you know, it's interesting, Eduardo, we, you know, it's kind of that big enlightened aspect of life. Who am I? You know, who am I? That's, that's what it's this quest. And really in looking at it from your perspective here, a growth, a growth mindset and, and how do you identify, I would almost want to change that to who am I to just, who am I becoming continually? Who am I continually becoming every day? I'm somebody who's continually becoming X, but who am I? I guess I don't want to land on one thing and just stop there. Back to what you said a second ago. That's, that's boring for one thing. I mean, it's no, you know, to finally have just arrived and stop and coast. I mean, we know that just with, gosh, with people who have, uh, I struggle with that sometimes with people who retire and they just want to, oh my gosh, can I just be done? But then there's no becoming. And it's, I think after a little bit of play, a few rounds of golf, it kind of gets depressing and, and boring. So do we identify with somebody who's consistently becoming? Man, I love thinking about it that way. Thank you. Yeah, I love that too. And and I, I think there's a tension there between kind of who am I becoming can be a bit, a little bit future oriented, right? But it's, okay. and and then versus like staying in the present and, and enjoying the present and who I am now and the experience that I'm going on right now. So there's, there's a tension between um, enjoying the process and what's happening right now and the process of growth and not just living in the future outside of the present, right? So there's, there's something there to, to kind of work on as well. No, that's really good. That's it's funny too because I I get called out a lot for not being in the present and being in the future. So well said. Uh, it's funny. I wrote. I sorry. What I wrote down. Who am I so far? So at the moment, yeah, yeah. So far, uh, I'll play with that. Okay. No, no, no next, but I think it's good. Yeah, yeah. Think yeah. about the future too, and what what we want to do, and what we might the adventures we want to go through. So so think about the future is great too. Uh, we just want to also um, be in the present and in the process of what's happening right now. Yes. Thank you. Uh, well, okay. The second one then of your five key elements that drive growth purpose. And that one, I mean, we all hear that a lot. Uh, you know what? I almost want to say that. I mean, can we, can we do that? Say your purpose as far as you know it right now, uh, that is something that I've talked with these kids about because that can be so daunting if you're young and you get this idea of a purpose, but they haven't experienced much. They don't know much. I think, man, my, you know, all t- it takes some experience to figure out what you're about. And then I do hope that my, I do feel like my purpose has stayed true. You know, what I do best, what my inclinations are, what my talents, gifts, skills, uh, the things that I care about have stayed true, but they've gone through a lot of different seasons and vehicles, ways that I've walked that out. But ultimately knowing that purpose, I guess that's another aspect of hope then, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, for sure. The, the the idea that you develop your purpose and that your purpose can evolve gives us hope because the stakes are not high that if I don't have a purpose right now, uh, you know, I, I'm not doomed. And so the, Carol Dweck has done some research with other collaborators on the difference between thinking about finding your purpose versus developing your purpose. And when, you've, when, we, when, we, when we encourage people or ourselves to find our purpose, it can be counterproductive because it might give us the idea that 
the purpose is fixed inside of us and we just have to find out what it is as opposed to tinkering and exploring and going to things that might be interesting or that might lead somewhere or might not and then kind of developing the purpose rather than finding it goodness yeah and it makes me think of the 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 job world that if we think we are the job or we are you know just that role in the job that that's a fixed mindset you lose that job then and you're just bereft or you think I've got to find the exact same thing and people don't realize the transferable skills. If you know your purpose overall and say, okay, here's, here's what I'm about. Here's what I'm good at. Here's what I care about. And I'm going to do it in this way through this opportunity. And if that comes to an end and there's a lot of other opportunities I can do it in, that's a growth mindset. And again, yeah, it speaks so much to hope. I hadn't thought about that before the show. Yeah, you know, I, I, that resonates like for me in, in the purpose of contributing to other people in helping people drive learning and higher performance. Um, it also helps see opportunities that could be great. Like, for example, I, I wasn't planning to write a book, but when an opportunity to write a book arose, it it fit with my purpose, right? If I, I could right. see how this, this is it's not something that I had in mind, but I can see how this is aligned because it, it drives my, it, it, it will help me uh, do give the contribution that I want that I'm working on. That, yeah. Thank you. The third one you have here is beliefs. Um, man, that is one of the biggest topics to me in this. I mean, if we look at personal development overall at, at all of us, at our efforts to grow, I get pretty, I don't want to say wrapped up, but man, beliefs just feel so much gravity in that. And as I read what you wrote on that, it brought me thinking about how often my beliefs unknowingly confine me. And that's not a growth mindset. If I get, that's hard though, Eduardo, because we want to believe that something's good and right and true and whatever, but that that can be, I, I don't know, how do you reconcile that? Because that can be, we want to you know be solid in our beliefs and yet, if we're just fixed, man, that can get us, that can get us in trouble. Confining, as you said. Yeah. So our beliefs affect our perceptions and our behaviors. And so we need to do what you're doing of reflecting on what, what are my beliefs and what's getting in the way and what's helpful. And so a growth mindset and the fixed mindset is an example of a belief. A growth mindset is a belief that we can change and a fixed mindset is a belief that we can't change. Um, and a growth mindset has lots of um, benefits, uh, but a fixed mindset can might be appropriate at other cases too. Like, you know, I think, you know, height is something that's hard to, for adults to change, or like, for example, to, to get better at doing two conscious things at once. I, I don't think that I can get better at that. That's a fixed mindset. I think that's helpful because then when I want to be more effective, I try to figure out ways to focus more and to be more mindful. Um, so a fixed mindset is not bad when it's true. It's just that we we can never be 100% sure of what's actually fixed. So I would say, you know, in that chapter, I talk about beliefs. I talk, I, I kind of um, highlight three of them, but there's many. Uh, one is growth mindset and fixed mindset. So that's our belief about competence. Mm -hmm. Another one is our belief about transparency. Uh, often we believe that transparency, like sharing our thinking, our emotions might put us in harm or might be used against us. And when we share transparently, when we have those relationships with trust, then it helps us learn and perform better. So that's our belief about transparency might be something to kind of reflect on as well. And then our reflect our belief about agency, you know, do, how much agency do I have in my life? How much can I chart my path? And when something kind of happens that leads to a mistake or to failure, to what extent do I kind of put the locus of, of control on other things and I just make up excuses or or just explanations that are beyond my influence and control, or to what extent do I focus on what I can control, what I can do, what I can influence, uh, and kind of err on that side. Uh, so those are kind of beliefs that we can think about in terms of you know how they affect our perceptions and our behaviors. Goodness, that's 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 a big one. Yeah, and, and uh, gosh, if anybody wants to go deep on just that aspect, uh, the danger of our beliefs is what I'm going to say, because I come back to it. I did a show, you guys can look it up uh, with Andy Norman. I don't know what date it was, but Andy Norman, his book is called Mental Immunity. And we talked about the danger of beliefs that you're talking about in here. And we went really deep on that. Now you just mentioned transparency and I'm thinking about, because uh, number four is habits. 
You know, so what are the habits I can, and it made me think about vulnerability. I was reading Brene Brown's, one of her books recently about that. So if I say, okay, in my relationships, I believe I would benefit from being more vulnerable. So if I'm going to do that, what's a habit I can put in place? I'm literally thinking, you know, I could just make an appointment with my wife, a kid, a friend, whatever, and go, okay, let's try this out. I'm going to share something. That's a tangible something that's going to bring an action into place. Maybe kind of uncomfortable, but that's a habit that I can put in place to actually do this, which brings back, you know, go from the, just the performing of my life to not only we actually learn and change and grow. Yes. Yeah, totally. Yeah. We can think about to your point, what, what are the habits that are going to help us, um, whether, you know, get better at transparency, for example, it could be an exercise with our family, like you're saying, or with our teammates. And I think there's a difference between transparency and vulnerability, depending on how we define vulnerability. But to me, if you look in the dictionary, vulnerability is kind of taking a risk that might harm you. When you feel vulnerable, you feel like you could be harmed. Mm -hmm. And so when we share transparently, we, we might feel vulnerable because other people might use that information against us or it might, uh, they might make fun of us or they might think less of us. And so when, when we share transparently, we might feel vulnerable, but as we do that more and more with the people around us, then we develop trust and we develop the, the belief, the understanding that when you share transparently with me, I am going to listen to you and be grateful for what you shared and respond and be in that conversation with you. And eventually you'll be able to share transparently without feeling vulnerable, right? Because we have that relationship. That's great. And so in our families or in our, in our teams, we want to be, transparent, whether it feels vulnerable or not. Gosh, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm taking notes here, Eduardo, uh, transparent, if I can be transparent and grow and, and kind of, and learn that I can do it without feeling so vulnerable. That's awesome. The last one that you said here is community. Um, and which I right away, anytime I see community right now, I think of blue zones. Uh, just, I love the power. I love the analogy of, and the, I, well, I, I, I love, and I'm daunted by the power of community. I think that is the thing that's going to help us or hurt us the most in our efforts, but talk to us about community in regards to a growth mindset. Sure. So we think of growth mindset or fixed mindset, for example, as something that is in our minds is an individual quality. But in reality, we're social beings and we're highly affected by the people around us, whether it is in our beliefs or our habits or our identity or our purpose. All of those things are really influenced by the people around us. And so we need to think about who are the people around us? Uh, what kind of relationship are we building with them? How much you know, trust uh, are, are we building trust with them? Are we building a sense of belonging? Are we building a sense of collaboration or competition? Sometimes people are in competition with each other versus in collaboration with each other. Um, and so those are things to think about to build build relationships with the people who are aligned with us and, and so that we can continue to grow so that we can learn and perform better together. All right, well, I just took your book down because this next segment, I just, I wanted to pull out. It's your, uh, I think it's chapter six, the six common misconceptions. Um, I love that you put this in there because it's one of my favorite aspects of a topic to say, how are we missing this? That's what I often want to know. Cause I, you know, I think I knew it. I thought I, if you had asked me before I had your book, you know, do I have a, do I know what a fixed mindset and a growth mindset? Is? Yes. And what are you, Kevin? I'm growth mindset. Well, obviously, well, I'm not as much as I thought. How's that? I, I'm, I have, I have plenty of room for growth. Um, so I love this that you put in there and you go through these misconceptions. I'm, I'm going to do a couple here with you. Uh, you said mis misconception number one, a growth mindset is the same as positive thinking, working hard or persevering, and it magically fosters growth. Reality, says Eduardo, a growth mindset is the belief that our abilities and qualities can change if we engage in the learning zone. Unpack that a little bit. Yeah. So like you said, when, when we learn about growth mindset, it's very powerful. We get excited and it's really easy to distort it into something else. Like earlier, you mentioned being open-minded. That's probably the number one. When we ask people, what does a growth mindset mean to you? People say yeah. it's being open-minded. Yeah. Um, but a growth mindset is a belief about the nature of human beings, right? And, and the reason that that's important is that when we believe we can change, then 
we can engage better in soliciting feedback or in doing other things to, to improve. Um, and so being clear on what a growth mindset is and that it's necessary, but not sufficient. We have to believe that we can change, but we also need to know how to change, which, which it involves not just performing and, and doing things, but also engaging in things like listening to your podcast. Right. And earlier you, you talked about kind of your work. I think in a lot of your work, you do both performing and learning at the same time, right? Because in these conversations, you are asking questions, you are, you're learning, you're modeling learning. Uh, when, even when you do your, you know, your podcast, the, 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 you know, every single episode of your podcast, you are performing, you're creating something of value for others, but you're learning in the process. And that's what I call learning while doing, which is what I think is the greatest opportunity for most of us is to shift the way we do things so that we are getting things done and improving at the same, at the same time. Yeah, it's interesting, Eduardo. I started this doing the fourth episode uh, where I do a wrap up. I started that. It hasn't been that. I don't know. I don't think it's been a year even that I've been doing that. It has been the thing that's helped me learn the most. I mean, as we're sitting here talking, I'm thinking, oh, that's a key point that I'm going to pull out and, and, and work on and grapple with. And I'm going to talk about that in episode four. I mean, I literally have to sit down and go, okay, what's, what is it? What the jump down? I go back and read my notes and go, holy smokes, that's what I want to change. That's been the best thing that I've built in. And I didn't, I didn't perceive it at first, but it's so powerful. You're, you're right. And I, I'm blown away that I get to sit here and yes. Yeah, so are we performing here? Yeah. I mean, it's great fun, but it is, we do a good show. But the ability to learn within it is just um, one of the greatest gifts ever. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. It's, uh, I do the same. You know, I have the privilege of also, you know, learning so much in my work as well. But do you bring up something which is that we we don't learn from experience. We learn from reflecting on experience. We don't learn from mistakes. We learn from reflecting on mistakes. So in that episode four, yeah. you are reflecting and 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 you're reflecting your own packing. You're integrating that into your mental models and figuring out how to shift your mental models. You're you're figuring out how to take action and identifying how you're going to take action. And that is something that we can all benefit from because one of the human biases that we suffer from is we tend to overestimate how much we remember things and how much you know we'll take action based on something. So we'll learn something powerful from listening to your podcast and then, oh, like, yeah, like I just need to listen to more podcasts and then I'll learn more and I'll change more. But actually, if we if we consume less content and just process it more deeply and 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 put in place habits to actually take action on those things, uh, we can get more out of it, more change out of it than if we just focus on getting more and more and more content. I, amen. I, and I say that even as a purveyor, sometimes I feel like the best thing I could do is tell everybody, go, turn the podcast off and just focus on the thing that you need most and keep repeating that one. I do appreciate, yeah, again, the series, you know, that we're going to spend so much time on this topic of mindset instead of just hitting it and running on uh, to the next thing. Uh, so yeah, it's, yeah, go ahead. Well, that's the thing that I love about your podcast, Kevin, is that you go deep, right? And so in going deep, you help us listeners go deep too and identify what our, um, our, our takeaways are and how we're going to take action. Because we, you know, when we learn something in a crash way, like, I, you know, in school, I would just do a crash studying to pass a test and yeah. then we forget it right so like you i don't remember anything that i that i learned in school but when we have um when we do those things in between like spacing them out especially when we sleep in between sleep helps us consolidate that knowledge and put it into long-term memory and so when i'm listening to a series from you like you know i listened to your series on boundaries recently with terry terry cole um i didn't do that all in one day right so that helps me um, sleep on it and think about it and have some questions, write some notes, uh, go to the next episode and go to the next episode. And that then helps me put it into long-term memory and take action. Uh, so I love the structure of your podcast. Uh, well, thank Well, thank you. And thanks for being a part of it. I'm, I'm honored. Uh, I want to hit a couple of the more of these misconceptions. You have misconceptions number two, the trap of the performance paradox, all this emphasis on learning and growth hinders performance. Like, do I, do I have time to, it makes me think of that, you know, go back to business. I'm so busy working in my business. I don't have time to work on it. It's so often what we get to thinking. Now you have the reality is 
learning drives higher performance and impact if we hold ourselves accountable. And it brought me to thinking about the working smarter type thing. Am I better off just to be slogging it away here? I mean, I'll have days like that where I'm just slogging away and think I do not have time to take a break and realize, and, oh my gosh, I got to take a break. And when I do, I come back and I'm three times more productive and I get far more done having had the break than if I just stuck it out. But, it, but again, we're, yeah, we run into that cultural, I mean, I don't want to just pick on school, but it is, you just kind of go through the school day. You don't stop and, and ponder or, or or leverage your strengths or whatever. You just get onto the next class, you do it. And it seems like we get programmed into that. You just stick it out. You don't quit. You make it to the end of the day, leave school, clock out, whatever, as opposed to know what would really produce better results. Yeah. And so when that is what the big, the biggest thing that comes up when people learn about the, the, the learning zone, the performance zone, people really like it. They want it more in their lives and work but they see two biggest obstacles. One is fear of, you know, being a learner in front of others. And the other one is time. I have so much to do in so little time. I don't have time yeah. to engage in the learning zone. But the first thing to notice, and we see this across industries, is that the, the performers who figure out ways to habituate the learning zone, they achieve higher results. They achieve higher performance. Um, but at the same time, the way to maximize immediate performance is the performance zone. And so if you're in the last week of a quarter and you're a salesperson, you want to like meet quota and you just care about sales for that week, it's reasonable to just focus on the performance zone that week, make as many calls as possible, just perform, perform, perform. That's fine. But if we do that every week, then we won't, you know, we won't find completely different and more effective ways to, to do our job. And so that's what we need to figure out. It's like, it's fine to be in the stuck in the performance zone for a temporary period of time, but then that's a problem if it becomes the default. So how can we change our habits and our systems so that we're doing both, you know, as part of the default? Um, I, I'm going to jump back because there was something I was going to say a minute ago or, or based on what you said, and I forgot about it and it just came back to mind. And then I'm going to come back to where we are right now. And you it said, um, shoot, I don't know the word you use, Eduardo, but, but in a sense, cr critiquing our performance. Um, and you brought me back to use the example of Beyonce. So she's out here, she does her big concert in front of a zillion people. And then instead of afterwards, go you know party with everyone, she goes back and watches the show uh, completely and critiques herself. I mean, with grace, let's say, uh, obviously, but she said, how can we make this better? Oh, the lighting was off there. I missed that. My hair looks bad there. I'm not wearing that outfit again, blah, blah, blah. And she continually improves. And it just reminded me as a culture and also myself sometimes how we tend not to do that. And it brought me back to a, my early days of of bike racing was BMX racing. So, and we were in this, I was in Memphis, Tennessee in this big warehouse and they had this track set up and I had a really terrible day and I wasn't used to that. I'd kind of just been naturally good and fast and whatever. And then I got, it was a big race and I got my butt handed to me and my dad had me come up into the stands. He says, let's, let's spend the next hour watching these guys and see what they're doing that you're not doing. I was mad at him at first. Um, I was kind of ashamed of my performance anyways, but that was, that was a big experience of going, oh, let's go let's see what's happening. Now, it would have been better back then if I had a tape of me to see what I you know, had done. But that concept of that, I mean, how often I actually thought, man, I've got to spend some time going back and listening to some of my own shows right now. I'm not doing that enough. How can I do that? Am I saying, uh, um, er, like, you know, in filler words, am I, I know I have the propensity to get excited and talk too fast. And if I'm, if I want to sound wise, like Zig Ziglar back in the day, I'd get slow at the end and make a point. It really stands out. And I forget that. And so thank you for bringing me that of, of what, what is the word? Is that the word you use? I'm not sure if it was, but kind of critiquing and auditing our performance. Is yeah, that critiquing is a great word. Um, it, it brings up for me, one of my mentors is Ron Berger and he's an incredible educator and he's big into critiquing drafts of our work or student work or, 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 um, so critique is a great word. And yeah, you, you were so lucky to have your dad, Dan, as a mentor. He's uh, he's a master of, of self-improvement. Um, so yeah. that's fantastic that you had him to support you. Yeah, it is. I, okay. So this, this aspect, oh, this next one, then, um, this is an interesting story here, Eduardo, this happened today. 
I was actually, I, I, I went to a doctor's appointment and so I thought, well, I'm just going to pick you. I'd kind of finished our, my notes on, on this and stuff, but I, I, I'll just take the book with me in case I have to wait. And I did, the power went out. And so I was sitting there forever and I went back through these and I, and I looked again at misconception three, all praise and encouragement is good. And you said the reality, some forms of praise and encouragement can be helpful if not misdirected or overdone. So turn the page over and you talk about some of the work that you did in your studies with Carol Dweck and the unintentional consequences of well-intended praise. And they said, and here's what you wrote. They found that praising children for being smart backfired. When children were praised for their intelligence after doing something well, when asked whether they wanted to try a hard puzzle or an easy, most of them chose an easy puzzle, you know, and they didn't want to, they didn't want to fail. So that becomes their identity in essence. Okay. So I have an, I have a 17 year old who's already in college classes. Uh, He got it almost perfect on his ACT and his SAT. So he's just applied to colleges. He's already got full ride offers and it's so hard not to not to just even in fun, just, you know, my, my kind of the, the old goodwill hunting, my boy's wicked smart. We talk about that and it's become this thing. So I took a picture of that though, and sent it to the family chat and said, God, I said, my, my son's name's Canyon. I said, buddy, I'm so sorry. I've been doing that to you lately. Cause you're just killing it out there. And you know, Canyon, dad, this is my smart kid. And this is my, you know, affectionate kid and whatever. And yet that's, as opposed to, man, I'm so proud of the effort that you put in, that you persevered in your schooling. Cool that you got the grades, you know, but uh, your effort, it's just so hard not to praise for the performance. It's, it's all as a parent, especially. Yeah. Yeah. And then we can praise for the performance, but then also be clear about the process that get us there. And like, what's the next challenge? You know, what are you going to do? What, what, what is uncomfortable for you? Where, where are you, you know, going into the next level? And, and so for Canyon, you know, I think um, is thinking about that. Am I in, when, in, when we think about performance goals and we can seek per, what's called performance seeking or performance avoiding. Performance seeking is like when you're trying to get straight A's on everything, for example, um, and you might not take classes that are uncomfortable for you. You mm. might take classes what, that you know you're going to get a straight A, right? And so uh, that might be limiting to you. That might be limiting in terms of exploring, exploring other things that you might be interested in, or that might help you in your domain, whatever you're, you want to do with your life. Uh, performance avoidance is when you don't even try because you don't want to fail. So those are two different forms of kind of having performance goals. And, um, and so Canyon can, maybe he is like, you know, taking on great challenges and, and nailing them. And that's awesome. Right. Um, but the question would be, is, is he not taking risk where he might not get the A and is that limiting, limiting him in some way? Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. It's so, it's so interesting. All right. And another one here that I want to hit that I so appreciate. Well, and I'll give the preface for why, you know, so you just listened to my book, one of the big myths on drive that I wholeheartedly believe in have experienced is that some people have drive and some don't. It's just totally not true. We see it by that, that concept violated all the time. We all have the ability to be just as driven as somebody else. It may be, you know, in neutral right now, your drive may be, or you may be uh, being fueled by some of the wrong things, but you've got drive. Okay. So your misconception here is that you either have a growth mindset or you don't. Like that, that's just some propensity that we got like red hair. Ah, you know, John got, uh, got uh, a growth mindset and and Bob doesn't. Now you say the reality is that mindset, mindsets exist on a spectrum. They are contextual, fluid, and can change over time. And what you're saying is all minds, we all have that ability. Yeah. Yeah. And we all tend to see certain abilities as more fixed or more developed, or we might see some people as unable to change, whether us or other people, while we see others as able to change and grow. And these things change. So we might, um, you know, we might see creativity as something that's fixed in people. And then we might go to a design thinking workshop where we experience a process where we become a lot more creative and we can say, oh, wow, I could actually develop my creativity. So our mindset about creativity might shift. Well, let's hit two then on, you know, kind of the nature versus nurture. Uh, I, would say, I, gosh, you know, as I, and, and my parents are going to listen to this. So I'm going to be respectful here. I would say mom and dad, that there are some things 
that as a kid, I was grown up and exposed to that, which is my point here, that some people are going to have been exposed to growth or, or fixed mindset more or less. And that's going to affect their propensity, not their, you know, it's, it's not a, a set point at all, but just a, a propensity of what they're used to. And that I grew up in some ways with a, a very, very growth mindset. Uh, and yet there were some other ways and I'm going to pick on religion. You know, we were in a, a very, especially in my early, early years, um, more of a, a strict religion that I think was very fixed. Now that I see it, I know my parents would agree too. So I got to see both, but I think they let, I mean, I know they led the spirit of our home was a growth mindset. It was, it was on personal development. What a gift as opposed to somebody else who grew up in, let's say a scarcity mentality and a very confined and limited and uh, a fixed mindset that you may not have been exposed to it. So it may be, so I'm, I guess I'm saying it's fair enough to say this is going to be harder for some people. Absolutely. For um, and we, there's research that shows that the way parents speak to one to year olds to three year olds affects their mindset, and also how parents view failure. Whether they see failure as a way to learn and to try that is part of the process to improve something that's enhancing, or failure as a as a as something to have always avoid. That also affects the the mindset of the of the of the children as well. Okay. Gosh, thank you there. Well, uh, this, uh, this next one, I want to hit it to, uh, misconception growth mindset is all about responding to setbacks and mistakes. Okay. So that's the misconception. The reality proactive growth is a lot more powerful than staying reactive. Tell us a little bit more about it. Yeah. So we, we want becoming to be the default, right? We want our growth to be the default. And so what are our habits that we use to continue to make sure that we are always changing, that we're always growing, we're always improving. It could be like listening to your podcast, right? Uh, that could be a habit that exposes me to new areas of growth, gives me new ideas on what I can work on and ensures that I'm always, you know, have opportunities and I'm always continuing to grow uh, versus seeing growth mindset as just if I make a mistake or if I have a failure, then it's an opportunity to learn. That's that's great if that happens. Like when, when we fail and when we make a mistake, we want to see it that way, but we want to proactively drive our growth as well. Okay. Well, I'm going to read the last one here too. Uh, here's again, this is the misconception that we can encourage our loved ones, team members, or young people to grow, but only they can take action to achieve results. You say the reality is if we want people to grow, we also need to cultivate environments that are conducive to growth. And, and, I, and am I right in coming back to just what I talked about with my son that in saying in, in praising just his performance, you know, smart, that that's a that's not the best environment for him to have a growth mindset. I can alter my. So you go with that. Yeah. You know, if you just if you only praise your son for performance, then one way for him to continue to perform well is to do things he already knows and to not take real risks where he might struggle or fail right and so um so yes absolutely um but you can also praise the performance and also praise the pro i mean you live self-improvement your son learns self-improvement self from you all the time but you can also make those connections more explicit right in terms of helping him think about the challenges and the hard work he put in into it to get to where he is where he wants to go next uh, and what risks that might entail, where, where he might fail. Um, but also you talked about your parents, right? And the, the environment that they created that helped you kind of foster a growth mindset and and habits to continue to to learn and develop. Yeah, it's got me convicted on, and I know, you know, I've got older kids now. My oldest is 28 and I've still got younger ones and I've learned through their pretty much gracious testimony that there have been some areas where, you know, my beliefs and being so rigid and certain in my beliefs did not help them with a growth mindset. And I've had to work on that. Not that I throw away my values at all, but how do I, you know, what's the container of belief that I have around that, that I may be limiting them with. I, I do, I want to testify to the book real quick, Eduardo. I really appreciate how you put it together. I mean, this is, this is a, it's a difficult topic, uh, are not a, a difficult concept, I think, for me to look at how am I doing this? That's why we're here. That's why I agreed to, I wanted to do this is I want to look at this and, uh, well, every chapter he has, has reflection questions. They're so good. They helped me think through some stuff. And what I've, what I'm going to do for myself is kind of an audit and kind of go through some highlights of where, 
I mean, I need to, you know, be on the positive side too, where I'm doing well, but I really want to look at, gosh, where am I, where am I faltering some and, and maybe don't have the growth mindset that I have. And the reflection questions really help. And interestingly, as we ended up talking about parents and, uh, you know, for, I want everybody to hear this really, it's the, gosh, it's part two of the book is taking these concepts. It's literally called overcoming the performance paradox in teams and organizations. So anybody out there, obviously you first think about your work, your business, uh, you can do that. I'm also thinking about my family. I got a big family. How can I do this with them? So I'm going to study that, uh, as well. Uh, but this is something, I mean, I, obviously, you know, this is a book to study, to get and to walk, to walk through and to study. And I would say any way that they can connect with you is going to be good as well. Um, and actually, let me do that. And, and folks, I'm just so grateful for everybody joining us on this journey to fuel and come into alignment with our drive and mindset is top of the list. This again is Edward Brissino. Uh, Brissino, I said that right? Okay. Yes. I yes. Get it right. And he's, the book is again, the performance paradox, turning the power of mindset into action. Uh, he's co-founder of mindset works. And again, that was along with Stanford psychologist, Carol Dweck, and you can connect with Eduardo. It is B R I C E N O dot com and find everything you've got to offer there. We're going to be back again for part two to hear how he's walking this out in his life. And folks, if you appreciate the podcast and want to share it with others, give us a rating on Spotify, leave a review on Apple and leave a review. Talk about this specific episode. It'll help us both know what you got out of that. Uh, you can see this episode on YouTube and find us on social media. There'll be a bunch of clips. We'll take out some of the really good clips from this and, and all of our shows and find me at Kevin Miller C. Oh, and if you want to learn how to master your own inner drive, you can get my book that Eduardo read. God bless you for that. What drives you? You can find it on Amazon or anywhere in whatever format. And until next time, stay driven. Yeah.